The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Okay. So our next speaker is Dr. Andy Foden. Um, he is the Bridge Evaluation and Technology Manager from Complex Bridge Group of WSP USA. Dr. Foden's career has primarily focused on bridge technology, high performance materials, and advanced bridge assessment and management systems. Andy has extensive experience implementing uh, advanced NDE and DT methods for bridge and structure evaluation and has overseen the instrumentation and monitoring of bridges all across the country. He has also been involved with the structural analysis and modeling of highway, railway, and pedestrian bridges and other structures. Andy has worked on all aspects of bridge design, including widening and seismic retrofits. He is the author of numerous papers on bridge assessment and management, bridge design, material characterization, and fatigue analysis. As an active ACI member, he has been working on the development of codes and design standards for concrete bridges and associated repair materials. Dr. Foden received his BS in civil engineering and his PhD in structural engineering from Rutgers University. All right, good, good afternoon everybody. Pleasure to be here in uh, Salt Lake City and see a room full of people. Sometimes afternoon starts clearing out, everybody's heading to uh, other things, so it's good to see a full room. Load testing, it's been done for a long time, but typically what I see the application is doing it on large or complex bridges. So what I wanna talk about today is, okay. So what we're trying to do at, at WSP is optimize and create a very efficient way of running load tests so that we can use these load tests not just for the big bad bridges, but also for the much more common bridges that our clients are trying to manage. Quite often the bridges that have poor load ratings are off the main highway system. They're on rural routes, county roads, but they still have to be load rated or load posted and oftentimes, the, the, just because of the large number of these bridges, they are a, a big concern for our clients. So we're gonna go through a, a, an example of this for a specific project for uh, Rhode Island DOT. These are our uh, glorified culverts. Some people would categorize them as, as a three-sided open box culvert. Um, 10 foot spans, typically. So if you look at the NBI definition of a bridge, they, they define a bridge as 20 foot span. So you wanna call it a culvert, you can call it a culvert. We consider them a 10 foot span slab bridges. Talk about the, the goals and, and, and load testing results for that project and some conclusions. But the client was hoping that we could find some lessons learned from this sample set of bridges that could be applied to a wider subset. They had a lot of bridges in their inventory, similar configurations similar uh, load rating concerns. So we wanted to see, could we learn something about these bridges that could be applied to the wider population? So here you can see the, the bridges here scattered across the, the great state of Rhode Island. So, so this is matching that. <laughs> All right, I'll just go with it. Um, Bridges are 90 years old or so, built in between 1927 and 1937. They have a lot of these structures, as I mentioned. When you look at them, we do our, our visual inspection, our biannual inspections. They're generally in good condition. Some very minor spalling, um, a little bit of efflorescence here or there, but you look at them, these particular bridges did not have any significant cracking. Um, 
However, when we did load ratings follow the ash, following the equations in AASHTO and the manual of bridge evaluation, they had very poor load ratings. So here's a, an example from one of the three bridges. They were, again, very typical. Over uh, creeks, we had water depths below uh, from three foot to 10 foot. So accessing to uh, apply our instrumentation was uh, a challenge I'll talk about a little bit more later. But there's a couple of very uh, interesting details. So the first one is, is the bonding stones. So these were placed in the uh, walls of the abutments and to provide uh, lateral stability to the top slab. But there was not a moment connection between the slab and the walls, just these hook bars. Second concern was gaps in the reinforcement uh, near the walls. So every other bar stopped uh, about four foot short, I'm sorry, two foot short of the wall. So they were staggered. And that created quite an issue when we did our load rating, that not having those bars there. We did go in and did a GPR assessment to see whether or not that was actually what was out there. Did, was there reinforcement that maybe wasn't shown on the plans? that we could count on. Uh, GPR did not indicate any additional bars that could be relied upon in our, our load ratings. Uh, the other uh, issues is that we had varying degrees of fill, so we had anywhere from one foot of fill to four and a half foot of fill on top of these bridges. And uh, the bridges had been widened, typically in uh, the 50s and 60s. Uh, so we want to also evaluate the joints between the original. That was changed and this one's back, okay. So yeah, I mentioned the, the bridges all looked great, but when you do it on paper and you follow the, the equations from ASHTO, they had very poor ratings. So what, what did we want to find out uh, from our load testing? So number one thing is look at the distribution of the live load through the fill. ASHTO gives you some recommendations for how to distribute that load. We wanted to validate that, that assumption. We also wanted to find out how much uh, the effective width of slab should be used when we apply our live load. And finally, the fixity of, of the supports. Is it a slab with simple supports on either end, or is there some moment continuity that we can rely on that would greatly reduce our, our moments? Because if we have some moment fixity, um, get a, a big bump in our load ratings. So our load test, we want to have a live load distribution factor for use in the current and future analysis. The way this client wanted it presented, typically we would do an equivalent with. In this case, they wanted a, a distribution factor, which is more common term we use with girder bridges, not with slab bridges. But the, the way they wanted to be able to do this in the future, if they had found a additional corrosion that they wanted to account for or a new permit vehicle, they wanted to be able to do a 2D analysis apply a distribution uh, factor to it, and be able to evaluate the structure using that. So that's why we're using a distribution factor on a slab bridge. So we started out with an a priori model of, we used uh, Lucis as our software, did a fairly detailed model, but not crazy uh, research level models. We're trying to make this as efficient a process as possible and reuse, uh, because of the similarity of these bridges, as much of the modeling as we could to increase that efficiency. But the, the end goal of the load testing was to really calibrate those models, looking at those three parameters that I identified earlier. We want to keep this very simple and efficient and streamlined, so we're not looking at, at a research level project here. Strain gauges, LVDTs, anywhere from 13 to 18 sensors per bridge. So very focused on this. Again, look, there's three things we knew we needed in our, our model to, to calibrate it. And we focus all of our instrumentation on those and not trying to, to do a, a PhD thesis. So this is all done from the underside of the bridge. Under each lane of the roadway, six inches from the wall to, to look at the shear. And then at each of those construction joints, we wanted to have sent, uh, LVDT on either side to measure any differential deflection. In all cases but one, there was no evidence of any longitudinal crack at those joints. And uh, that, was, that was shown to, even at that location that they were still performing 
as a singular unit. So efficiencies, here's a, here's a couple of things uh, that were very important to, to making an efficient design uh, of, of our instrumentation plan. So we had a two week schedule to complete all three bridges. The first bridge was done in four days, the second bridge in three days, the third bridge in two days. Keys to the, achieving the, the speed of those processes. First one, we were dealing with a waterway underneath this, so we had in advance uh, a team go out and scout these locations from a local office. And then we hired a contractor to go out there and install scaffolding. So we had a nice dry work area. We had typically four foot to five foot of headroom to work with. But it really sped up the process not having to deal with the water when we get out there. Another thing to, to uh, being efficient is we ramped up our labor. So what you don't want to do is go out to a, a job site and your first day and you got four guys and you're ready to go and the scaffolding isn't right or the, there's some other issue that uh, is going to prevent you from getting your work done efficiently. By ramping it up, starting with two people, then we added second day a third person, next day a fourth person. We were able to uh, accommodate any uncertainties as we started off. Couldn't, didn't make any sense to go past four people for these little bridges. So um, that was kind of our, our maximum plateau. Another very important thing, you don't want to get out into the field, find out you have some trouble with your equipment. So all of these setups were, were done in the office with the exact configuration that we would use in the field. Verified that all the equipment was working properly, was calibrated. So when we went out in the field, plug and play, ready to go. So these bridges uh, had, had varying widths. So uh, this particular bridge shown in this photo had five lanes. We used uh, three dump trucks loaded up to 65 kips each, uh, three axle trucks. We were trying to really uh, get an equivalent loading to uh, the, the design load and simulate that. And actually, I'm sorry, the, the legal load. And here's an example of, of the results that we saw. So because the, the spans are so short, 10 foot, the truck axle spacing is just slightly greater than 10 foot. So you see the first strain at mid span as that first axle crosses over and then the, the larger strain as the two rear axles pass over. And the, the other blue is, is right under the load. These other are the strain gauges further away. Now, that's not unexpected for the, the strains at the positive moment area, but what we wanted to know, what kind of strains were we going to see in near the supports? Were we getting a negative bending, which would indicate that we had the restraint, or would we have nearly zero strain, which would indicate that we're a simply supported slab? So here, here's two different examples. So bridge number two, if you look at the results here, you're, you're between one and three micro strain. So that's almost uh, barely noise in your system. So for that case, there's, there's no measurable frame action that we could rely upon. However, if we, if we look at the results for bridge three, now we have much, much larger uh, negative moment strain there. So for that bridge, we concluded, and also for bridge one, that we did have moment restraint. Simple model. The idea here is the simplest model that can produce the results that we need. We didn't want to go, to go crazy with it. It's not a research level model. It's a production, production model. What we found from our, our uh, testing was the head walls acted as edge beams. So we wanted to account for that in our model. The joints we found behave very rigidly. Again, we, we had LVDTs on either side of those construction joints to measure any differential, just like the, the previous presenter. Um, and in their case, I'm sure if they did a load test on that, they would have seen a, a differential across that joint. Um, these joints behave very rigidly, and therefore we modeled them as rigid elements. So calibrating the model. One of the big differences looking at a small bridge versus a large bridge. This bridge had a 10-foot clear span. 
our original assumption was, well, we're going to support it at the center of the abutment head wall and have a 11 foot span. Well, the difference, but not a big difference, right? Six inches on either side. It's nothing on a 100 foot span. On a 10 foot span, going from 10 foot to 11 foot changes our moment by 21%. So that assumption of where that support is made a very big difference for this model. So for our model, we decided to, as we calibrate, we're going to support this at the front face of the abutment, the 10 foot span. And then we're going to have a line of springs there and adjust the rotational uh, stiffness of the springs to provide the moment restraint that we measured. For the slabs, uh, we, we did a Schmidt hammer testing and correlated that with some previous core results. So we knew we had about six KSI of compressive strength in our slabs. The abutment walls, you know what, we didn't care. They were way over designed for you know, what we were looking at. The 2.4 KSI that AASHTO MBE tells you to use was adequate so we didn't waste any time, any energy, any effort monitoring the, the, the abutments. Another finding from our, our testings, again, we had one foot to four and a half foot of, of fill on these, including the pavement. Ashtook tells you to go a ratio of one to 1.15. Yeah, my five got carried over to here. It should be 1.15. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> what we actually observed was a distribution more of one to two. <clears throat> that made a big difference when you talk about four foot of fill, the distribution of that load down to our slab in our, our load ratings by the observed distribution versus the AASHTO recommended distribution. So again, going back to what it is our, our client was looking for. They wanted to be able to, in the future, they want to have to come back to us and have us do another finite element model to give them a new load rating if there was a new truck or a biannual inspection found some deterioration that they wanted to account for. So they wanted this distribution factor that they could have in their uh, records and simply apply that to a 2D force effect of a simple beam model, run whatever trucks they wanted across that, come up with moments and shears, apply this distribution factor to, to that number, and they have something to compare to their new condition. So an example of, of the amount of uh, increase in capacity that we achieved by these load ratings. So for one of the example bridges, using the distribution factor from a previous analysis, it was 0.119. What we got from our, our calibrated model using our load test, our critical region now went from point to 0 0.066 or 0 0.058. So about 43% increase in our distribution. That's a, a very big jump, and we feel very confident in it based on our, our measurements in the field, also based on the observations that there's no signs of any cracking or distress in these structures even after we pass these trucks over top of it. So our, our conclusions for that uh, load rating that we had varied degrees of, of frame action, um, no apparent, but what we weren't able to do, that one of our object objectives I mentioned earlier, was to be able to learn something from these that we could use on a larger population of bridges. Particularly when it came to the moment restraint, we had two that had restraint, one that had virtually no restraint, so you really can't say, oh, I can apply that to any other similar structures. Um, we certainly did learn about you know, the distribution could certainly be taken as a larger number. Probably um, not enough evidence to give a specific number, so it probably would default back to the AASHTO number there in most cases unless you had a reason to do additional investigation. So the small uh, structures have unique challenges. So I, I talked about the assumptions in, in span length. Another issue is with instrumentation itself. Typically for concrete, we want to have a, a much larger gauge length uh, so we get it's a non-homogeneous material. So the, to measure uh, 
effective uh, stresses or strains, you want a large gauge, gauge length. But at the same time, you don't want your gauge length to be more than 20% of your span. So, or, or L over 20, yeah. So we were kind of confined by the making a, a large enough gauge to get rid of the non-homogeneous effects, but also not getting too large that we're overlooking the local effects of the stress and strain. Small structures, you're limited by the number of people. It's just a geometric thing. You can only have so many people on that scaffold under the bridge. So you gotta make sure your workforce is planned for uh, very efficiently and everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing and has a uh, efficient uh, plan of action. And another uh, lesson learned is if you do these uh, bridges in, in groups of larger numbers and you just move from one bridge to the next bridge with the same crew and the same equipment, um, you can get a great economy of scale just by being able to reproduce that work over and over again. So conclusions on the cost reduction aspect. So instrumentation cost and time. Instrumentation, the cost for it itself isn't necessarily going down, but it's becoming much more for the same cost, much more robust, much more user friendly. A lot of it's plug and play instrumentation now. We don't have to be out there um, soldering strain gauges and you know, there's systems out there that are very robust, they're very durable, have a long service life, very accurate, and can be installed uh, very quickly uh, with a crew with nominal training. So we're, we're seeing some cost efficiencies on the instrumentation side because of that. Fuel time, we're seeing uh, being able to take advantage of those items I discussed earlier, planning this out properly, linking bridges together, gr or grouping them together. We see a, a, an efficiency in fuel time. Analysis time, a very slight decrease. Um, for any model, you've always got to do quality ch uh, checks of the model and verifications of it. So the economy of scale for a small bridge versus a big bridge, it's not that much. So we're not able to reduce our analysis time much. <coughs> Only thing we can really do there is make sure our models give us the accuracy we need and not anything that's overkill. And finally, an important item for, for maybe future efficiencies. When we've done load rating reports up till now, or load testing reports, they're written, written like a research report. Our clients are used to looking at, you know, aren't used to looking at these reports, aren't maybe as familiar with the techniques and the technologies. So we have to spend a lot of time writing to that and explaining every step of the process and all the nitty gritty details of what we did. Eventually, we'd like to get to the point where these could be much more like a bridge inspection report. They're, they're very uh, plug and play, you put in your pertinent details, and you can really get some efficiencies on the report writing side. So that's it for, for my uh, presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. There's a question. Oh. Oh. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my only question was, uh, you said that uh, you characterized the bridge joints as rigid. Uh, yes. What, what, what uh, did you use to verify that assumption? Right, so in the field we had an LVDT at mid-span on either side of that joint. And we looked at the deflections of both and they were both within a thousandth of an inch the accuracy of the, the gauges. All right. Yeah. Without doing some.